Activated. Analyzing. Update complete. What's up, Lore Masters? Today we're taking a look at the Constitution Class Starship, a Federation Class 1 heavy cruiser. Because, you know, it's exploration only. The Constitution Class existed in a different time. It was a time when the Klingon Empire and the Romulan Star Empire were still considered massive threats to the Federation. Most heavy cruisers of that era were utilized as multi-purpose vessels. They were both sent for exploration, for civil actions, and military necessities. We first see the Constitution Class in service to the Federation in the late 2230s, early 2240s. And to be honest, the more I research this vessel, the more I begin to question some of the commonly held beliefs. I honestly don't know if there were only 12 ships that were Constitution Class in canon. This is something that's well known and honestly comes to be a theory based on one line as far as I can see. This line is of course done by Kirk in Tomorrow is Yesterday, where Kirk states that there are only 12 ships like the Enterprise in the fleet. First, technically you could say there may be 13 ships. Kirk may have not been counting the Enterprise, but let's go ahead and assume 12 as that's a safe bet. That doesn't mean that Starfleet stopped making Constitution class ships especially if they were the front line of defense for Starfleet. Nor does it confirm that all but the Enterprise were destroyed after that point. It is possible that the first 11 or 12 originals were destroyed, the ones he was referring to at the time, but not the ones that were after it. In fact, we have reason to believe that some ships survived. Given what we see in TNG Relics, when Picard talks about a Constitution-class bridge being in a museum, and the dialogue after that leads us to believe that it was not the Enterprise specifically. And that's not even to mention that we see a Constitution class in the debris at the Battle of Wolf 359. I sincerely doubt that was the Enterprise. So with that in mind, I really just wanted to take a minute to dispel that possible rumor. I, I honestly start feeling like I am the Adam ruins everything of the Trek universe now. But let me know what you guys think in the comments on that. Given the Federation's vast territory and the need for security and exploration, Constitution-class vessels would be dispatched in opposite directions, far, far away from each other. It would be rare for the vessels to ever interact with one another. Now, a few sources have claimed that the largest gathering of Constitution-class ships was at Starbase 11 in 2267. However, when reviewing the episode that a lot of them refer to, I only ever confirmed that there were two ships in space, and couldn't really verify in dialogue that it was any more than that. And we definitively see more Constitution-class ships in other episodes, so I don't think that this was where the biggest or largest gathering was. Being a part of the Constitution-class ship was one of the highest honors for a Starfleet officer in the 23rd century. It was also one of the most hazardous. Given the purpose of the Constitution class, vessels of this sort were often the first ships sent to investigate dangerous or unknown circumstances, and they were the first to be sent into battle. A lot of these ships would be used to test new technologies that might malfunction, such as the M5 Multitronic unit, where several Constitution class ships were damaged. The configuration for the Constitution is definitively iconic. You have the saucer section, which comprised most command and control areas, scientific endeavors such as labs, and crew accommodations. Additionally, the bridge would sit atop in some form of a dome. Which is, of course, to allow an easy target for enemies, because why not give them an easier time, am I right? The secondary hull would include engineering as the bulk of its structure, with shuttle bays and some space for additional necessities of the ship. There would normally be two nacelles that connected directly to the secondary hull. This would become a staple of most Starfleet designs going forward. Due to quote-unquote minor refits that would occur over the years, the ship would sometimes change in shape, the windows would sometimes move, and the coloring would be off. Because when I think minor refit, I think making the bridge dome smaller, because that's just going to be easy to replace. And people said Starfleet didn't have job work programs to keep citizens busy. The primary command and control for the starship would be located on deck one, the bridge, in a very efficient design that every class of ship should have used, but we will see stopped when the Federation started becoming overly pacifistic and Starfleet began to stagnate, the commanding officer would be positioned in the middle of the bridge with the ability to swivel and see any of the officers or consoles on the bridge itself. 
The con was located directly in front of the captain's chair and encompassed astrogation, sensors, navigator station, and controls for the weapon systems. The other stations, which included communications, engineering, another weapons control station, gravity, damage, environment, science, security, and other stations such as the gelato machine, would be mounted against bulkheads circling around the bridge itself. The bridge in its original state would have only one turbo lift, but later in minor refits, another turbo lift would be installed and could be utilized by the bridge crew. Because again, when I think minor refits, it's installing another fracking elevator that goes through all of the decks. The saucer section will also have up to 14 science labs as well as an officer's lounge that could also be a dining area. While the bridge would have only one turbo lift pre-minor refit, the ship itself would have at least seven that could go through various different parts of the ship. On deck six, the medical bay would be considered the safest place on the ship for reasons. It would have a medical lab, a nursery, an examination room, and the chief medical officer's office. After the 2270 refit, the facilities would be updated to include micro-diagnostic tables as well as a medical stasis unit, if not multiple medical stasis units. There would be transporter pads and rooms throughout the ship's saucer section allowing the transportation of personnel to other ships or destinations off the vessel. As stated before, the ship would have six recreational rooms that would have three-dimensional chess and card games situated at various tables. We also see the ability to eat and drink at these recreational rooms as well. Along with this, there was a holographic rec room, an arboretum, gymnasium, bowling alley, theater, and chapel. Yeah, a, uh, a chapel. As I discussed before, there was also an officer's lounge located at the stern of the ship where those who had a commission didn't have to deal with the non-commissioned officers. Because... equality, I guess. The secondary hull, which encompassed most of main engineering, was where propulsion and power was supplied for the ship. Engineering was located at deck 14 and 15. Deck 14 would be where the anchor spot for the framework of the warp nacelle pylons were and Deck 15 would be where main engineering was and where most of the engineers would be. During refits, main engineering would be drastically upgraded. The main reason for the changes would make a bit more sense than most other refit changes as we see the warp drive technology progress and evolve and slowly begin to change. This would of course push the necessity for the room to change. The warp drive would be fitted with both lithium and dilithium reactor circuits which would allow the ship to achieve warp speed. The standard cruising warp of a Constitution class was warp 6, the original series warp scale of course. Though the ship could reach a maximum warp of 8, well at least that's what they say on paper because ultimately it would be able to achieve warp 9 at huge risk to the ship itself. Though apparently it could also do warp 11 for a small time. Because as we all know, if you're in a go-kart and get it up to 120 miles per hour, and it can barely survive that for a few minutes, then certainly you can get it up to 500 miles per hour and still somehow it'll stay together because that's just logic. Additionally, the ship would be fine while in tow at warp 22 because just like if you took that same go-kart, hooked it up to a jet fighter and increased the speed of that jet fighter to 1,555 miles per hour, then you'd have no problems whatsoever because it's being towed and thus would keep its structural integrity. The ship would have standard impulse engines that can maintain warp factor 0.8, and I never could figure out how fast that is in miles per hour, I'm sure it's pretty fast though. The landing and cargo bays would be located on deck 17. The ship was originally thought to be equipped with only four shuttles, but at various times we see that there are more or less shuttles on different vessels, so it's possible that the standard complement was four, but the ship could accommodate more based on its needs. The shuttle bays would ultimately have force fills that would allow shuttles to leave and enter the ship. I've read in a few places that there would be a refit that would expand and move the shuttle bay to deck 18, which would give it more access, though it was worded kind of confusing, so I can't be sure. The Constitution class would be armed with directed energy weapons that could, in theory, possess enough power to destroy half a continent in one bombardment. And we do have evidence based on dialogue in Star Trek Discovery that the weapons at full power could decimate an entire planet if they focused it enough. The ship would additionally have phaser banks installed by 2266. These weapons would have the ability to fire at stun, at heat, or at disintegration. To my knowledge, we never see phasers used for stun in future iterations. Though, it could be likely that this ability would still be kept, they just didn't use it, or it's possible that the advancement of weapons or defensive systems would mean that the stun setting would be ineffective against other ships, and thus they wouldn't be able to use it. The weapons would be positioned on several forward phaser emitters located at the lower part of the saucer section. Aft firing banks were located above the shuttle bay and secondary hull. 
There would also be port, starboard, and midship weaponry on the vessel. The 2270 refit would mean the Constitution-class ship would be mounted with three dual emitter phaser banks on the ventral side and three on the dorsal side of the saucer section. Two single emitter aft banks were set above the shuttle bay and four midship single emitter banks were located in the ventral surface of the engineering hull. Phaser power would also be increased by drawing energy directly from the warp core. This would of course mean that the phasers would not be stored in some form of storage system like we see with normal phaser banks, but would rely on main power to be on at all times. But I mean, if I'm honest, it really seems like they just put phasers wherever they thought it would look good on screen. The vessel would originally have six forward torpedo tubes that would be mounted both fore of the ship and aft of it. As with everything, the refit would impact the torpedoes as well as you would then have two forward firing torpedo launchers installed. The Constitution would have one of the most advanced deflector shields for its time, depending on which refit, the shields would encompass four different segments, or possibly up to multiple smaller grids along the surface of the hull. The shields would also stick to the frame of the ship versus a bubble. As an aside, I know that we see the shields go from sticking to the body to going to a bubble in TNG. Now in real life, the reason the shielding changed was because it was easier to create a bubble effect than to stick it right next to the armor. In fact, we can see that they wanted it to stick to the armor when you look at TNG in DS9 where sometimes during battles, the ship being fired on will look like a direct hit, but take no damage. And then sometimes they just use the bubble effect. It seems likely that the shielding would always have stuck to the ship itself, which is what we see here. Additionally, the computer system would be a duotronic system, which apparently there's things that explain it, but I still don't understand it, so whatever that means. For those who want to be on Jeopardy, the Constitution appears in the original series a total of five times outside of the Enterprise itself, nine times in the Star Trek films, 12 times in TNG, four times in Deep Space Nine, and once on a display in Voyager. It also comes up three times in Enterprise and two times on Discovery. So what do you guys think? How do you like these more long form videos while we're at it? Let me know your thoughts on the Constitution and my new style and I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded. Thank you so much for watching this video. This is actually the YouTube cut. If you'd like to see the Lore Reloaded Producers Cut, which includes actual clips of the shows with more videos to help with context, consider becoming a patron for as low as a dollar a month. Not only is there more content for you to see, but patrons get to see these videos a full two days in advance. If you're interested in seeing it but don't want to become a patron, then head over to LoreReloaded.com. The Lore Reloaded Producers Cut will be uploaded a full day in advance before coming on YouTube. Lore Reloaded is completely fan-funded and relies on viewers like you. Thank you so much for your consideration.